weak, then I am strong. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated in the presence of God. I'd like to share from the thought, understanding prayer in a pandemic. Understanding prayer in a pandemic. Let us pray. God, not my will, but your will be done. Never me, God, but you preaching to and through me. Now, O oh Lord, make me nothing that you might become everything. So that the words of my mouth, but the meditation of all our hearts may be acceptable in thy sight. God, you are our strength and our holy redeemer. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Understanding prayer in a pandemic. There is a article written by a gentleman by the name of Sutton Turner. The article is entitled, After a Crisis, People Go to Church or People Run to Church. And to validate his, uh, his uh, claim, he lists some of the um, historical devastations or tragedies where there is measured an increase in people flocking to church. He talks about, uh, he lifts up Pearl Harbor. He, he lifts up the crises, the financial crises of 1929. He talks about the uh, financial moment in 2008, and he also lifts up 9-11. Uh, he, 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 he measures and he says in each one of these crises, you can see a surge of, of awakening in the consciousness of people who are flooding either to the church or they have become consciously aware of a spiritual need and a religious practice called Christian faith. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about uh, one of the uh, historical moments as uh, Hurricane Katrina. And he doesn't mention Hurricane Katrina because it's a different sort of devastation. It, it, the churches that they would run to then were underwater as well. And the pastors that they would seek were in the water with them. That was not a time when the people ran to the church, but an opportunity for the church to run to the people. And I believe that the balance is that the church should be both uh, should be in both practices, that we should have a floodgate of people running to us because we they see us running to them. Ah. And, and so he he says that there's a surge in these moments of crises that the that the world rises up in their spiritual awareness and their need for church. However, the, the surge is not so great that the surge makes a difference in what now is a graph of a steady decline for many years. What the surge really suggests is that once people find the norm to return, they return to what they did that was normal. Let me put it another way. Once the, 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 the abnormal that is the changes that come following a crisis become normal after the crisis. People who once flocked to the church will go back into the world and leave the church again and the decline will continue its route. And maybe the reason why that is, is that as preachers, we are so busy trying to heal the human heart with fluffed up preaching. And we're trying to act like we have the answers for a tomorrow that we're uncertain of, that we don't catch the wave to be able to teach people the reality and the realness and purpose of church is to teach, to equip, and to celebrate. Break God, but instead we're trying to capture members when we should be really trying to uh, capture souls for Jesus. So now we're in a place where uh, we can see it happening again. We're in we're in a, a a pandemic moment, and 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 people will tell you that even though the churches are empty, that our virtual worships attendance has has 
more people in it than ever before. Memberships are tripling and doubling because once again, they have surged forward because now they stand in need of a connection and the relevancy of God. They're not only bombarding the, the airwaves and watching whatever preacher they can watch and hear to get hope, but they also are tearing down the prayer lines that people are praying now like ever before. And if we don't catch the wave, well, a lot of people may find themselves being disappointed, not because God don't answer prayer, it's because they don't understand what prayer really is. And so we have to come to it. So we find that Paul is in a place that, that he is in his own pandemic and he's really teaching us what he's learning about prayer. And so when we're in a pandemic, this is the moment we should be teaching you and as a means of trying to reach you. We must teach people that the church is not a crisis, a crisis center, but it is Christ-centered. That means that when you're in a crisis, you still have Christ. And when you're out of a crisis, it's still about Christ. And so we have to come to a place where we understand something about prayer because I know prayer is being practiced like ever before. When we were, when we had the first Wednesday and they shut down uh, Maryland, the airways were so filled at noonday prayer that phones had been cut off, prayers had to be sliced because there were so many uh, uh, bombarding the line for prayer that the, the lines couldn't hold the weight of it and they had to adjust. We had to get new numbers. We had to have a new day, a new location just so that we could pray because people are praying and you keep on praying but before you get upset, before you lose patience, before you get misguided, I think this is a good time to tell praying people and to uh, teach to praying people understand prayer in the midst of your pandemic and Paul teaches us this he says when we pray don't pray half cocked watch what he does Paul says I sought the Lord three times thrice Paul says that that I have a pandemic, it's a thorn. He doesn't name it. But the, the theology says that this thorn was messing with him spiritually and physically. Paul, does, Paul doesn't blame the thorn and he doesn't say it came from China. He, 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 Paul says it is a messenger of Satan. Paul says, I know where my thorn has come from, but I'm going to go and seek the God I know who can get rid of it. And yet when he goes, Paul goes like many of us that don't understand the full, under, don't have an understanding of what prayer is. He goes to God half cocked. In other words, he tells God what he needs, but he don't listen to what God has to say. Let me see if I can tell you. We have an, we, we, when we go half cock, we'll give God our Rolodex of problems, but we don't ask God, what is your plan in my problem? Let me see if I can help you. When we start saying things like name it and claim it, that means you name it, you claim it, but ain't no God in that. God just does what you tell him to do. When you, we start saying, you have not because you ask not. There's no God in that. We believe because we ask, even we don't have any faith, that God is obligated to do what we've asked because there's no ask. There's no asking God, what is your plan while I'm in this problem? What is it that you're trying to say? What is it that you're trying to teach me? And so when you go into prayer, prayer is not giving God just our Rolodex of, of concern and problem. But prayer is also asking God, what is it that you want me to hear? Let me see if I can help you. Prayer is like going to a doctor or a physician. When I walk in to a doctor's office, the doctor is going to ask me. He's going to say, what's the problem? 
I'll tell him my ills. I'll tell him my hurts. He'll examine me. He'll take my blood pressure. He may do some blood work. He'll take my temperature. He'll look in my ears and my mouth and up my nostril. And when it's all over, I notice something. I never go into the doctor and tell the doctor what to prescribe. I go to the doctor and I tell the doctor what's wrong. And then the doctor tells me what I need to get through my problem. That's the same way it should be in prayer. You can and go to God and say God I wish you removed this thorn but you should wait and ask God but what are you going to prescribe and let me tell you something I learned about sickness uh, that sometimes uh, when you have a sickness or an ailment a doctor will tell you this uh, I'll give you something that will soothe it I'll give you something that will put it in remission but you'll have to live with it the rest of your life uh, Paul had a thorn and God answered him he said I ain't going to remove it but you may have to live with it come on in here church we're in a pandemic and when God lifts it there are some things that have changed that you and I are going to have to live with and live through because it ain't going back to normal help me somebody because there are some prayers that you're going to ask God to remove it and God says no I need it to stay you're going to ask God to give you a job he says no I need you to grow there you're gonna ask God to get rid of friends he says no I need them to teach you how to love unconditionally you have to pray and understand your problem God's plan hey <laughs> first thing understanding prayer is not one-sided prayer is telling God what's on your mind but also prayers listening to what God has on his. And we're preaching. Secondly, prayer is the assurance of his presence. That, that, that when we pray, we should be praying not only looking for his answer, but we need to know he's present. I got to tell you this, in this pandemic, my wife, has found black and white TV again. Child, I done seen Father Knows Best, Bewitch, Hazel, and, and <laughs> none of my favorite shows. Andy Griffith, yeah, but the rest of them. But she, um, so, but I was watching and I walked in and every time I walked in, I saw this one scene that all of them seemed to have. And um, back then the, the husband and, and, the, and the wife uh, the husband would go to work, the wife stays home, takes care of the um, house and, and the children. Glad we have found the equality of God in male and female. And now that we have it, and some women say, I don't mind going back to where I came. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm just messing with y'all. Uh, uh, <laughs> because they just wanted to make sure that the, the men understood that they're equal and not less than. They said, now that the brothers got down, they didn't put the husbands in training. They said, I can go on back to the house if you just want to bring the bread in. But anyway, they, 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 they come in. The husband always come in, opens the door, drops his key at the always little table. He said, I'm home, honey. And um, she comes running. And I always made, I always dressed like they're going to church. Different so women, they dressed up. They come and, and, and they, kiss, they kiss and give each other's greetings. And they re you realize they really don't want nothing. He comes and he says, hello, I'm home. She runs, she kisses him. How was your day, honey? But they really don't want nothing. But they do this because they just wanted them to know I'm here. And I need to know that you're here. Because when I know that you're here and you're fine, then your presence makes my day brighter. The prayers like that, that sometimes I, I just need to know that God is present. I, I don't even need to, if I don't know the plan, at least let me know you're here. Let, let me go a little deeper now. When our oldest daughter, Ashley, was in the hospital for about a week, um, Ashley, uh, 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 unbe uh, uh, just unorthodox for her at her age and her size, to be suffering from uh, high blood pressure. 
and they, they, there was one night, and they put her on some kind of um, antibiotic and uh, uh, IV. And um, they, the, the, the purpose of this medication was to bring the blood pressure down. Well, her, wife, her mother and I, we never left her side. And so while I'm there, I'm being educated, and we're being educated on, uh, on the machinery and how it works. And you want to know what you're doing to my child. And I remember the nurse and the doctor saying, what we want to do, we want to bring her blood pressure down. But we don't want to bring it down too fast because there's complications. It had to move at a pace. So I was on duty that night. And um, uh, the nurse went to lunch. And the chief uh, doctor was behind a glass wall. I never left Ashley's side. And I'm sitting there, and I'm watching the blood pressure monitor. And as I'm looking at the monitor, I realize it's moving too fast. So I get up, and I go into the glass office, and I said that the blood pressure monitor says you're moving too fast. He looks at it. He don't say nothing. He says, okay. I sit back down. I look at it and I say, oh, no, it's moving too fast. I get back up and I said, you need to come now. I'm telling you it's moving too fast. This is what got me. This fool had to call another doctor for the doctor to tell him what I, the non-doctor, told him. But this is what the, 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 what, what, the, what the chief doctor told him. The chief doctor said, cut the machine off. She's moving too fast. But this is what got me. I'm running back and forth trying to get somebody to help me because the blood monitor says she's moving too fast. Ashley, sleep. Why are you sleeping when you got IV and blood pressure problems? She says, and the reason why she was sleeping, because she knew her parents were there. She says, all I needed to know that if you're present, I can close my eyes because I can sleep since you ain't going to sleep. And when I come to pray, I just need to know that God, you're right there with me. As long as you're present, this is what I know. They ain't going to put nothing on me that you ain't going to, that you're not going to let me be able to handle. They can only go but so far, just like you did for Job. Job may have suffered along the way, but you told the devil that you're going to have to stop right here. You can do A, B, and C, but when you get to D, he belongs still to me. I pray to make sure God is present. Hey, watch this now. I'm almost done. He says, understand, prayer is the plan of God, the presence of God, and the provisions of God. That, that you, 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 you pray for God's providence, for God's provisions, for God, for God to provide. It's interesting because watch this. Paul was not listening and Paul was not feeling him. That's why he had to go three times. The third time, he hears what God said the first two times. My grace is sufficient. How do I know that God answered the prayer each time? Because the condition never changed at each prayer. Grace was working when he asked the first time. But he was trying to get out his problem. Grace was working there when he asked the second time. But he wasn't looking for his presence. And now he comes the third time. He said, ah, I hear what he said from the beginning. My grace is sufficient. Hmm. Now, now we, uh, theologian, when you go through, go through these the, uh, theology classes, they'll ask you, so Paul says, um, his, his grace is sufficient. I heard Paul say, and, and the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. And they would say, uh, did you hear him? What's his voice sound like? And I realized that how Paul was able to hear God was not so much through what he heard, but what he saw. 
when Paul wrote the letter to 2 Corinthians, the 2 Corinthian letter, he was somewhere between Macedonia, uh, and between Ephesus and Macedonia. He wanted to come and visit the church. Paul says that the messenger of Satan gave me a thorn as a means to slow me down. But when Paul gets, starts to write, and if you go read Acts chapter 20, even though the devil had given him a thorn to try to delete, deplete, and detour, and to just default or to put down his work, Paul is sitting there with pen and paper and realize he still is an itinerant preacher that he still spread in the gospel in spite of the fact that he has a thorn to slow him down. Don't y'all miss it. He says, I'm still doing ministry in the face of, uh, of, the, of Satan's message to stop me from doing ministry. And he realizes that the reason why I can keep being a traveling preacher in, while I'm in a pandemic or a thorn is because God's grace is keeping me when I can't feel like I can't be kept. Y'all ain't got it yet. So, so let me put it another way. I, I had a colleague call me and during this time, churches, they say, some churches won't survive the pandemic. Well, we're going to cast that demon out right now. But I had a colleague call me to give me a, a, a praise report. He says, you know, I don't have that many people at the church. He says, but I want you to know this past week uh, that I got a check in the mail from some help from our denomination. He said, but then I got some help from the bank uh, and they helped pay some of the bills because at that moment I didn't know how how I was going to make it but the reason why I'm able to make it is because grace was still at work in me and I want you to know that if you're looking at me listening to me can put your finger on your paws uh, even though it seems like tomorrow is uncertain uh, even though we hear tragic news uh, even though you might be on the front line go to work in fear know, know where your next meal is coming not sure how long you're going to keep a job if you can see in here me today then you know that grace is still sufficient because in spite of the fear God is still working that thing out and when I come from my knees this I do know if I can pray it grace is still there if I can believe it grace is still working if I can keep pushing grace is to God is still providing for me so I'm done understanding prayer in a pandemic Prayer is the plan of God, the presence of God, the provisions of God, but you have to understand you have the power of God. Watch what, what, watch what Paul says. Paul says, I take pleasure in my persecution. I, I take pleasure in my infirmities and reproach. Let me that. I take pleasure in my suffering and my slander. I take pleasure in those who challenge me. I take pleasure in those uphill battles. He says, because it's of the power of God. Because of the power of God that's in Christ Jesus. He says, he says I learned something in prayer. That oftentimes the surge of prayer that is taking place is the same thing that surged Paul. He got a problem he can't answer. And he got a problem he can't solve. And Paul says, this is what I learned about prayer. Prayer is really my power source to God. When I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. When I'm weak, that's when I pray for God and to God. <laughs> and, and, and so weakness means this, and I'm done. On uh, yesterday, I cut I cut my grass, um, and I have um, I have allergies real bad. I shouldn't have been out there, but my grass looks so pretty this morning that I was glad I went. But I mean, I got allergies going. The older you get, the worse they get, and um, and eyes burning. I, I scratch half the night. I like Lord help me. But anyway, so while I'm driving and scratching driving and scratching, all of a sudden the lawnmower, I get to the backyard and don't want to, the wheel don't want to turn. 
I'm turning the steering, but the wheels are going straight. I'm thinking, oh, now the lawnmower has broke. So I have to find a way to fix the lawnmower. I'm angry because the lawnmower is broke, and I'm angry because I can't fix it. I know I can't fix the lawnmower. So this is my weakness now. I have a mechanical problem that I don't have mechanical knowledge of. Yet, I don't find myself too worried or worried at all because I have a number to a mechanic. <laughs> and so what I do in my time of suffering, I'm going to call the mechanic in my weakness because the mechanic's going to come and be my strength. <laughs> He going to fix what I can. So ain't no need of me worried about it anymore because I know the man who can fix what I can. Y'all should be excited, right? And, and that's what prayer is about. When I'm praying, I'm weak, but I ain't worried because I just give it to the Lord who I know can fix it. And just in case you don't believe me, let me put it this way. We had a debt that we could not pay, but we gave it to Jesus and he fixed it. We had some sins we could not find forgiveness for, but we gave it to Jesus and he fixed it. We we had some dirt that we could not get out but we gave it to Jesus and he fixed it we had some stains we couldn't wash out but we gave it to Jesus and he fixed it we said some things we couldn't take back but we gave it to Jesus and he fixed it and just in case you're bound for what I'm talking about he took it up on a hill called Calvary he nailed it to a tree called the cross he poured out a blood that will wash us he went in a grave that will raise us and when he got up early Sunday morning everything that was broken had been fixed because the Lord in our weakness became the strength over our problem so when you pray pray to know that God is working it out even if you can't see it with your own eyes Understand that prayer may not be what you ask for. But understand this, prayer will be everything God has for you. So don't get discouraged if it take too long. He'll show up. And don't get discouraged if it don't come your way. It's going to bless you in the end. And don't even be discouraged if people make you question his presence. You just say, you still here, aren't you? Understanding prayer is understanding God's plan, God's presence, God's provision, God's power. And just for the note, Paul never lo lose the thorn, but he also gains greater faith simply because he prayed in his weakness. Worshippers, Westphalia, don't stop praying. Just keep going to God and tell God have his way and to pin your ears to hear when he speaks to adjust your heart to feel when he shows up to fix your eyes to see where he's providing and to fix your hope to experience his power and you'll pray without ceasing amen Amen. As the